before we get right into those uh, several verses, we need to consider the context as we do every week. Consider the context that the, this short passage falls in within the whole part of the chapter and what comes after as well. So as you look at the first part of this chapter, uh, Luke chapter 19, there is first the account of Jesus uh, meeting the man Zacchaeus. As Jesus visits this unpopular sinner, uh, this tax collector, uh, this unliked person by all the people, Jesus goes to visit him at his house. Uh, Then there's the parable of the ten minas that is given by Jesus, where he speaks of ten servants, each receiving one mina, and then depending on what they do with it, they either face a consequence or a reward. And then also in this chapter, what is... uh, spoken of before these several verses is the triumphal entry of Jesus as he is going in towards Jerusalem and many people are praising him, many people are recognizing him as the son of God, laying down the palm branches before him. And then, so that's what comes before and then what comes after these several verses is when Jesus cleanses the temple which you can read in the several verses after that. Then also in the following chapter, it describes where Jesus is speaking to the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, and the other church leaders. And then it's also important to consider uh, these verses that we look at this morning to remember that it falls in the midst of the Holy Week as Jesus was approaching his crucifixion, as he was entering the city of Jerusalem and would be approaching his time of crucifixion. So this last passage, these four verses that we're looking at this morning, come shortly before, as I said, Jesus would approach the cross. And as he looks over, as he looks upon Jerusalem, he knows what will happen to the city of Jerusalem and to many of the Jews in the years to come. And he first weeps over the city, knowing what is to come. And then he describes what will happen to the city, what will happen to the people, and also why these things are going to happen. So let's just read these, uh, these four verses together. Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. So as I said, this is immediately following the triumphal entry when Jesus is entering that area. And then it says, When he drew near, that is, near to Jerusalem, when he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. So as I said, Jesus had been entering the city. There's the triumphal entry that is described. And now he had drawn near enough to see and look over the city of Jerusalem. And when he sees the city of Jerusalem, he weeps over it. And interestingly enough, this account only occurs in the Gospel of Luke and not in any of the other Gospels. However, also elsewhere in the book of Luke and elsewhere in the Gospels, you do hear Jesus speak and lament of the future of Jerusalem and what is going to happen uh, in the future for it. So Jesus knew the fate of the physical city, the actual literal city of Jerusalem itself, its coming destruction and what was going to happen to it in the future. But more than that, He knew of the many people, the Jewish people, who had seen him, who had heard him, and who had refused to accept him as the promised Messiah, the promised one who was to come to save them. And as we think of Jesus weeping, as we see Jesus weeping here, of course the other example that would come to mind is where you hear that Jesus wept uh, after his, he hears that his friend Lazarus has died. So we've mentioned a little bit about it, but let's look deeper into it. Why is Jesus weeping over the city here? Why is his reaction of seeing the city of Jerusalem to weep? So as I was considering this question, I looked through several different sources of what different authors, different people had to say. In my own Bible itself, in the study notes, it says that the reason why Jesus was weeping over the city is that he he feels great sorrow over the rejection from the Jews. 
And he was not only reflecting his earthly heart, but reflecting the heart of God as he contemplates the Jewish people rejecting the prophets of the Old Testament and his son Jesus. And from another commentary, the New Daily Study Bible on Luke, it says, The tears of Jesus here are the tears of God when he sees the needless pain and the needless suffering in which men and women involve themselves through foolish rebellion against his will. He also says, He knew what was going to happen to the city. The tragedy was that if only they had abandoned their dreams of political power and taken the way that Jesus offered, it need never have happened. So they were so worried about political power and those things, they missed who Jesus was and the, the Savior that he could have been for them. And then finally in the NIGTC, another commentary, it says, As Jesus sees Jerusalem spread out before him, he weeps over the destruction that was to come over it. Unawares, the city could have learned the way of peace from his teaching, the peace that he taught, the peace that he shared with them, that he could have given them. But instead it would fail to recognize in his coming to earth the gracious presence of God offering a last opportunity of repentance. Instead, the attitude of the Pharisees would prevail. So here in these several sources, several reasons are given for Jesus as he weeps over the city. First, as he considers the rejection from the Jews and looking upon Jerusalem as the hub, as the center of Judaism, as the center of the Jewish nation, and what that would mean for the Jews as a whole for the, because of their rejection. Also, Jesus knew of the needless pain, the suffering that was to come upon these people, which could have been avoided if they had accepted him. And then, of course, the Jews were God's chosen people. We see that throughout the Old Testament. The tribe of Israel that God chose among all people groups. And yet they have repeatedly rejected him over and over again throughout the Old Testament. And you see that carrying over into the New Testament as the many Jews choose to reject their Savior, reject their promised Messiah instead of accept Him and accept the peace and the hope that He offered to them. So that we cover verse, the first verse where we see Jesus weeping over the city. So now we move into verse 42 where Jesus is speaking of what is to come. Uh, the first saying I want to focus on is He says, would that you, even you, had known on this day. So we're going to focus on that phrase, this day. What is this day that Jesus is speaking of? Again, in my Bible it says, when he says this day, it's speaking of the day when the true Messiah and the King came to earth. So when Jesus came to the earth. So broadly speaking, it's the coming of God's kingdom on earth. Or narrowly, if you want to focus in, it's that the coming of Jesus, the coming of Jesus as Israel's king. That is this day that is being spoken of. The Messiah, the promised Messiah that these Jewish people had been looking for, that they had been waiting for, the king that they had been waiting for was now there, was now right in front of them, speaking to them, and yet they chose to reject him and not believe what he had to say. Now, as I've been speaking, I've been focusing just on the immediate context that Jesus was speaking into, the Jewish nation. But this applies to us as well. We see this today in our world. As Tony spoke about, I believe it was last week or the week before, he spoke of the narrow gate and the wide gate. Only a minority, only a small amount of people choose the narrow gate that leads to salvation. Many would rather choose the wide road, which leads to destruction. Would choose the wide road where they can do what they like where you can do whatever makes you feel good, where you can pick and choose religion and spirituality only when it suits you, when it works for you, while rejecting the one who loves you, who loves these people, who offers an opportunity for salvation. So as we consider these words, as we consider what Jesus offers, we need to consider ourselves. What will you do? What have you done? What choice will you make? Which path will you choose? And will you follow him today? Will you continue to follow him? Will you make choices every day to follow Jesus? And then Jesus continues on. Would that you have known on this day the things that make for peace. So when he speaks of this, what is he meaning by the things that make for peace? That is specifically the things that would have led these people to salvation that they had instead ignored. 
For the Jewish people had an opportunity to receive this peace that Jesus offered to them. Flip over to John chapter 14, verse 27, which also speaks of this. John chapter 14, verse 27. I'm just going to read a couple of verses before John chapter John chapter 14 we're going to read from verses 24 to 27 25 to 27 sorry So Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit that he will send when he leaves the earth He says these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you but the helper the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So Jesus offers this peace. He offers this peace to the people if they will accept it. But rather than receive what Jesus was offering to them, many of them chose instead to reject, to ridicule Jesus, to condemn him for what he was saying, for he could not be the Son of God. They would not believe it. And now we may hear this, we may hear the choice that they made. You may look at the Pharisees and all the different people throughout the Gospels who condemned Jesus, who spoke down upon him, who crucified him ultimately. And we may condemn these people in our hearts and minds thinking we, we would never do that. We're much better off. But can we truly say in our hearts that we have never done this, that we have never rejected the words of Jesus for the pleasures of our world, for the pleasures that we want, for the things that we want to do? Do we always reject the pleasures of the world and choose instead the good things that Jesus offers? I know as I consider that myself, I can look back at my life, I can even look back at the past couple weeks and see the many times that I've desired and I've chosen the worldly pleasure instead of eternal gain. Something as simple as choosing to watch a football game instead of sitting down to read your Bible. Choosing to sleep in instead of attending a men's breakfast. Choosing a casual conversation with a friend instead of sharing the truth of Christ with them, the absolute utmost important gospel that you can share with them that could save their life, and instead of just choosing to keep it casual, not wanting to make any waves, not wanting to make things awkward. We make these decisions every day, whether we realize it or not. And every day, the decisions that we make affect the life that we choose to live and who we choose to honor with our lives, whether it be ourselves or whether it be our Savior that we are honoring. And we need to consider those. We need to consider these truths. So now we continue on where Jesus says, but now these things are hidden from your eyes. So again, flip over to John, John chapter 12, where we see this spoken of again. These things that have been hidden from your eyes. John chapter 12, verses 37 to 40. So it's after Jesus had been speaking to these people, the crowds that are around them. And it says, When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So here the author, John, this is from John's Gospel. He's quoting from the prophet Isaiah of the Old Testament, speaking of this time where the people would choose not to believe. And now these people that chose not to believe, that chose not to follow their promised Messiah, the Savior that had come to save them, they would be blinded by their hardened hearts. They had hardened their hearts against Jesus, against God, and their hearts would be hardened that they could not hear and believe. As I said, this is no surprise to God. Rather, it had been spoken of and prophesied through the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. So these people, many of the Jewish nation, they had seen Jesus walking on the earth. Many of them had seen him in person. Or they had heard what he had done through other people. They had heard what he had said. They had heard the words that he had spoken. Yet even though they had seen him, they had heard these words, they still would not believe. 
And now because of this rejection, this rejection of their promised Messiah, they could not believe. Their eyes were blinded, their hearts were hardened, and the way of salvation was hidden from them. So we need to consider this as we pray for those around us, even those in our family, friends, those around us that are unbelievers that choose not to follow God. We should be praying for them, not only that they would receive Him, but that their eyes would be opened, that their hearts would be softened, that their hearts that have been hardened against God would be softened, that they might see, that they might hear, and that they might believe in Jesus and what He has done for them, what He wants to give to them. Maybe you've experienced this, but have you ever had a conversation with a non-believer, with an unbeliever, who, and you're explaining to them the truths of the gospel, the truths about Jesus and about God and about His love, these things that seem so clear, they seem so obvious to you, that you've heard all your life, and yet you're sharing with, this, with another person, and they, can, they cannot understand, they cannot accept what you have to say. It's not just an intellectual issue that you're fighting against of making them understand. And if they only understand that they'll accept it and they'll receive it. It's not only an intellectual issue that you're fighting against, but it's a spiritual issue, as you can see here, that you're fighting against. Perhaps you've given someone a Bible or you've shared a passage of Scripture with them, something that encourages you, that encourages your heart, that speaks to you, and they cannot understand what they're reading, what they're hearing, what, what you understand is not the same for them. They cannot see and hear the same things that you see and hear. And as I said, we should not be frustrated by this, but rather we should pray for them, again, that their hearts would be opened, that their ears would be opened, that their hearts would be softened to hear the truth that God wants to speak to them. But at the same time, do not think that just because you share something with someone and they don't receive it, that they don't understand that these efforts are in vain. For you do not know the work that God is doing in their heart, that God, what He is chipping away at in their heart, the work that He is doing in their life, that they could maybe receive those words one day. And that He could use those conversations, those encouragements, those things that you shared or gave to another person to impact them for eternity. Don't ever downplay that. The work that you do, the things that you share, the love that you show. It can certainly be frustrating at times. But do not give up. Do not lose hope as you face troubles and difficulties in in your sharing. So we move on to the last two verses, verses 43 to 44, which both kind of work together. They both speak of this punishment that is going to come upon the city of Jerusalem and the people. It shows that Jesus speaks of a time that will be coming when Jerusalem will be put under siege by the Romans and will be eventually destroyed. And if you don't know, if you don't, haven't read the history on it, this did occur in AD 70 as the Roman army destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And Jesus speaks of this. He speaks of a time here where they will not leave one stone upon another. Or in other words, it's a metaphor for just total destruction of the city. It's also spoken of in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and referenced in multiple times in the Old Testament as well, where not one stone will be left upon another, completely wiped off the map, completely destroyed. And he says, this will happen... Right at the end of verse 44, he says, This will happen because you did not know the time of your visitation. That is why this punishment, this destruction will come, because they did not know the time of your visitation. So the question is, what does Jesus mean by this? As he says, you did not know the time of your visitation. Again, from another commentary from the TNTC, the author says, This last word, visitation, is quite general. It could mean any visit for blessing or for cursing. But in this context, in these verses, there can be no doubt that it is the divine visitation that is spoken of when God's Messiah, Jesus, came among them that the people had failed to know. So they had not recognized Jesus and His visitation upon the earth, what it meant for them. Again, in the NIGTC, the New International Greek commentary, the author says, Here the visitation is intended to be the occasion of salvation. Jesus' visitation was meant to be for salvation for these people, as was proclaimed by Jesus, but it was unrecognized as such. The same visitation that was meant to bring salvation instead would bring a judgment yet to follow. 
So this coming destruction, this destruction that Jesus speaks of, this destruction that Jesus weeps over, would be coming as a result of their rejection of Jesus. This promised Messiah that they had been waiting for, this Savior that they had been waiting for, they chose instead to reject Him. Their opportunity for salvation was ignored. And this is the same destiny that we see those today who reject Jesus in our day. Just the same as they did in their day, we see the same in our day. Those who choose to reject Jesus. For Jesus offers salvation to all who will hear, who will repent of their sins and turn from their sins and believe and follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He offers salvation to all those who will do that. The Bible is quite clear about that. But for those who choose to reject this offer of salvation that Jesus gives, only eternal pain, suffering, and separation from God and from all that is good awaits them. That is the truth that the Bible proclaims, and I hope that you believe that today. Interestingly enough, there's lots of different beliefs, and even this week I saw through a Christian page that I interact with on Instagram, a person speaking of an idea, you might have heard of it before, it's called universalism. Um, that is basically that eventually all people will be saved through Jesus. No matter what you do on the earth, no matter who you are, no matter what happens, you're going to be saved eventually through Jesus. There's more, there's more to it than that, but basically that's the idea that everyone eventually is going to be in heaven. Um, what amazed me when I saw this, it was part of a poll, and it said that 27% of the people on this page that saw this idea agreed with it. I, that was a very high percentage in my mind. I expected it to be much less. But it was interesting that this person also remarked that this idea that they believe in is uh, to be fair. That universalism is fair. That God is fair by saving absolutely everyone. Um, it's a hot button topic for me because in one college that I went with it was kind of forced upon me as a truth. And I don't really appreciate that that was done in a theology class. But that's, there's more to it than that. But anyway, there's not enough time to get deep into this debate this morning. That's not the point. But I share this simply to show that there's beliefs such as this that are held out there in Christian circles today. Spoken up from the pulpit by so-called Christian pathor, pastors and authors sharing ideas such as this and expecting you to believe it even though it goes against all that the Bible says, and it goes against the very essence of who God is. For this idea that God would save everyone is not fair. It would not make God a fair and just judge. For what person would call a judge fair if they let a murderer just walk free with no punishment at all? That doesn't make any sense. The only opportunity, as I shared, as we looked at this morning, we have to be free from the punishment of our sins is to accept Jesus as our Savior. Our Lord and Savior who took the punishment for our sins on our behalf on the cross, the only way that we can be free from that punishment is by believing in Him, by following Him. Then we can be free from the bondage of sin and death and walk in freedom. That is the truth, and that is the only truth. So as we come to a close, as Jesus shared in this passage, the city of Jerusalem as the epicenter, the center, the, the center of the Jewish nation would be punished for their unbelief. That was to come. That did happen in history. But more than the city being destroyed, the greater tragedy would be the many people destined for hell as a result of their rejection of their promised Messiah, their Savior, Jesus Christ, who had come to the earth. So as we see this, as we hear this truth, may we not make the same mistake. May we not reject Jesus as He calls us to come to Him and to accept Him and to follow Him. And furthermore, may we not keep this wonderful gospel, this truth to ourselves of what Jesus has to offer us and everyone but may we share it with those around us. Praying that God would open their eyes, would open their ears, and would soften their hearts that these people would be able to believe and to receive all that God has to offer them. So today as we go from here, as we, as we wrap up this sermon, as we go from here today, may we commit to follow Him today with all that we are. Let's pray together. Lord God, we just 
We're so thankful for who you are, Lord God. As we consider the truth, as we consider Jesus and the life that he lived, uh, the love that he gave, the hope that he offered, the peace that he gives us, Lord God, we are so thankful as we consider that this morning and moving forward, Lord God. But we pr I pray that we would not take this truth lightly, as has been shared this morning, that it is a truth that will affect our lives and the lives of those around us forevermore. God, and I pray that we would not downplay that in any way. So, Lord God, we just thank you for who you are, and we pray that as we wrap up our service that you'd be glorified and honored this morning. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.